Thank you, young people. I appreciate that. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Be a real famous story to you. I want to talk about Western idolatry this morning. No, we don't dance around the fire in the loincloth. I'm aware of that. We don't bow down to idols and statues that I know of here in the West anyway. But we are as idolatrous as any culture has ever existed. Maybe even more so. Uh, but in Acts chapter 19, beginning of verse number 23, at the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Now that way is Christianity. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain into the craftsmen. And we called together the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. So you see his first concern, all right? His checkbook. Moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So can you imagine somebody saying that? So that not only this one cra this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. That's a trademark of contemporary culture, by the way. On basically every level is confusion. And having sought or caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. I'm going to stop right there. The book of Acts is at once a window and a mirror. It is a bay window into the first century when the New Testament church was birthed into a highly multicultural, multi, it was a polytheistic uh, society. That gods were everywhere. They worshipped anything and everything. And the, the book of Acts basically tells us, the New Testament church in this generation, how do you navigate through these shark-infested waters? Uh, and it just seems like there's someone wanting to destroy Christianity on, on every street corner. And the book also serves not only as a, a window into what they were experiencing, but also a mirror. And as we look into this mirror, we see our own hearts in relation to the pressures that are placed on believers in the 21st century by our current cultural surroundings, the names that we are called, the pressures that are put on us as Christians, and we are told, keep your, keep your faith, keep your music, keep your belief. You know, if you want to do that in your building, that's fine. Let's, let's privatize this thing. But uh, actually, we can't keep what we know to be true privatized. This has got to be made public. And this is the rub. This is the problem. When we try to take our faith from here to there, that's where culture does exactly what happened here in this town, there was this great explosion of anger. And um, there, there are some fundamental questions that are being asked about us today. For instance, what is authentic Christianity? Are we doing the same thing? Are we believing the same thing that they believed in the first century? Do we have the same book? Do we have the same truth that they had in the first century? What, what do you believe? 26% of professing Christians don't believe the Bible is true. How can you even call yourself a Christian if you don't believe the Bible is true? If you believe that there are inaccuracies in the Bible, some things that weren't true. Hey, what about if one of those things happened to be the crucifixion? What if that happened to be one of those things that's not true? Or maybe even the resurrection. What if the resurrection falls into the category of we're not real sure this actually happened. You see the problems that we're faced with? Well, is it Christian to oppose the culture? Is it ever Christian for Christians to oppose laws that government pass that are supposed to govern our lives? 
Is it ever right for us to stand up and say, no, we will not do that? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. But I think there's a, there, there's a narrow margin, and it's, it's getting wider, however, all the time here in our country. Anytime a law contradicts Scripture, we are obligated to obey God. You say, well, what if that means we lose our taxes against status? Then we pay taxes on what we buy. What if that means that the preacher's going to go to jail? Well, y'all bring me a ribeye. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying there are times when you can't keep backing down. You know, we, we've got to draw a line and say, no, we will not move beyond this. Acts chapter 19 tells us how incredibly relevant. Because I, I realize that we don't, you know, we're not heathens in the contemporary uh, historical term, you know, we don't run around with loincloths and, uh, you know, eat chickens raw and, you know, we, we don't do that. But are we as idolatrous as any generation that has ever existed? And I submit that we are. Demetrius was the spokesman, evidently was the president of the Silversmiths Union. And they manufactured these little pocket gods. And they made a lot of money made out of silver. And so they were making quite a bit of money. Paul comes along. And as Paul was wont to do, he began to preach the gospel. Now, in the preaching of the gospel, always, 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 it became a trademark of Paul. He preached against idolatry because it was so prevalent in his culture. And so as he began to preach this, he began to mention names, start calling names. And he said, you know, those, those little, um, you know, the religious bling that you guys make, these trinkets, you know, the costume jewelry that y'all are making, making a lot of money off of, those aren't gods at all. Well, it just, it was politically incorrect. And Demetrius and his silversmith buddies, you know, they just went sucking wind. And, oh, what, what do you, are you, you actually say that if you, you make it with your hands, it's not a god? That's exactly what Paul was saying. Now, he began to preach this gospel and insulted the entire region. Everybody got ticked off at Paul. So much so that they started a riot. And they, um, well, idolatry is it's a very sly, deceitful thing. It morphs into whatever shape and form a culture will receive. It just, it becomes, it's like a, uh, like a virus. It, it, it becomes what is normal. It becomes what is acceptable in, in any particular culture. And it keeps up with the times. No, we don't have statues downtown. But do we have forms of idolatry here in the West, even now. Now, in Acts chapter 17, Paul is talking to the cultural, uh, the intellectual brain trust of Athens, and he was preaching at a place called the Oropagus. And the Oropagus, that means the hill of Ares, and Ares was the god of war. And so here was the faculty, the, the, the intellectual faculty of Greek culture had gathered as they were regularly uh, doing. And um, he had an opportunity to preach to these guys. And Paul, was, he was a brilliant man. And he had the opportunity, and he said, you know, I notice you guys are very religious. I've noticed that. He says, I, as I'm coming through town, on every lawn, there's a god. And they had gods of wheat and gods of water and gods of wind and gods of marriage. And God, they had gods of everything. You know, because they, they could not imagine one God being able to handle all that stuff. And so they were just so, so polytheistic. And he says, I, I notice that you have one over here that is to the unknown God. I'd like to talk to you about that unknown God because apparently he is very unknown in this city and in this culture. And um, so he starts talking about the Epicureans. Now, these were guys that were there at the Oropagus, all right? And the Epicureans were atheistic materialists. These guys did not believe there was a God. 
There's no heaven. There's no hell. And so if that is your theology, how can you live life? Any way you want to. And that's exactly what the Epicureans did. If it feels good, let's do that. There is no God to whom we are accountable. Let's just live any way we want to do. So there were those guys, these Epicureans. And then there were the Stoics. They were there at the hill of Ares. And these guys were formed by, founded by a man by the name of Zeno on the island of Cyprus. And Zeno is the one that brought this. He was a fatalistic pantheist. And, and pantheism believes that everything is God. Everybody's part of God. The animals are part of God. Uh, the wind is God. The wolf is God. The bear is God. You're God. I'm God. Everything is God. There's this big oversoul. And everything is part of this oversoul. And so you had these guys there as well. And Paul is speaking and he's preaching. And he brings up this subject of idols. Now he's just about to touch the biggest nerve in this whole region. And the bottom line is simply this. You either accept Christ as the redeemer of your soul or you're an idolater. Those are the only choices. You say, well, preacher, uh, I, I, I don't bow down. I, I didn't say you bowed down. You see, everybody worships somebody. The atheist worships. The agnostic worships. They worship themselves. They worship their own. This is what I want to do. This is the way I want to live life. And so, yes, everybody worships. Man by nature is a worshiping being. And the scripture gives us the road map to the right person that we are to worship, and that is the God of heaven. Now, we have upgraded our idolatry. I'm aware of that. We have stylized our idolatry so that it does not appear to be idolatry. It appears to be fun. It appears to be uh, recreational. It just it, it appears to be happiness and fulfilling, and I, I understand all of that. But we have in this country an, an outbreak, and it's been for several uh, decades, as a matter of fact, this expressive individualism. And what that means is that, you know, nobody has a right to tell me what to believe. Nobody has a right to tell me who to believe. I can believe what I want to believe. Leave me alone. I can do what I want to do. And when you, when you look at this overall concept of this expressive individualism in any culture, you are looking at establishing a platform for a multitude of idols. Now, uh, God is a creator. We talked about this in Sunday school a little bit. God is the author of life. He knows how life should be lived. And so he has given us these instructions in Scripture. He has given us certain parameters and boundaries for our moral behavior. I cannot kill you. Well, why? Because it's wrong. You say, well, why is it wrong? Because God does not kill. You know what's wrong to steal? Because you'll get in trouble. No, that's not what's wrong to steal. It's wrong to steal because God does not steal. See, God does not do that which is in violation of his nature. God is perfect. He's holy. He is without the capacity. It's not that he's so disciplined. He's not on the throne going, I'm going to be a good boy today. I am going, I will, I will, I will. No, he's, he's, not, he's not that way. It is not possible for God to do anything wrong. I, to me, that's amazing. I am full of the potential for doing stupidity. All right? Now, don't look at me like a calf in a new gate. You are too. <laughs> Everybody, you are capable of doing wrong. We all are. Now, exactly what is an idol? And normally, we think of, well, here's Diana. Got these little pocket gods. You put, and they would, they'd, they'd carry them around in their pocket. Um, and normally we think that as an idol. Well, yet for, you know, you may believe some Christian things. You may believe there's a God. Did you know that just believing in God is not salvation? Scripture says a very almost disturbing thing that the devils believe also. And tremble. 
And the word devil's there is demons. You know, demons are monotheistic. Demons believe there is but one God, and they know who that God is. They're aware of that. Now, why would, why would knowledge of God make you afraid? Why are they trembling today? Why? They, they believe there's one God, and they are shaking in that. Why? Because they know, number one, they are non-salvable beings. They can never be saved. That's a horrifying prospect. Number two, they're very aware of what the Bible says about their future. Very, very aware. Now, uh, what is, and I, let's talk about this, in Western civilization, in the 21st century, what is idolatry? Well, if there is anything that provides your identity, your sense of value, your sense of importance, your happiness, your security, your comfort, your fulfillment, or your meaning in life, if there is anything that provides those things for you other than God, that is an idol. There are two times in our lives when we turn to our gods pretty quickly. Number one, when you are celebrating. Now, there are a lot of people, when they, get cele that they celebrate, you know, they'll, they'll get drunk, they'll have a party, they'll do something that j just allows them to celebrate. And then, when they're sad. What do people turn to for comfort when they're sad? Some people do the retail therapy thing. You know, they'll go shopping. They'll go buy a car. Uh, you know, the car make me feel better. I deserve it, you know. Um, so here, basically, let me give you the, the definition of contemporary idolatry. It's not doing bad things. Idolatry is taking good things and making them ultimate things. That's what idolatry is. It is taking relative and created things and turning them into absolutes that give you your identity and your definition in life, whatever that is. Now, the language uh, of idolatry in the 21st century, pretty, pretty slick. Uh, yeah, I believe in God. I believe there's a God. Yeah, I believe there's a God. But if, if, I could, if I could achieve this, if I could get that, if I could marry that person, if I could dunk a basketball, you know, if, 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 if I could, then I would be somebody. See, that basically is idolatry. Because that is the way we find our identity and our value and our importance. You know why you're important? You know why you're important? So God loves you. You are the object of the affection of the creator of the universe. That's why we're important. Not because you're wealthy or athletic or good looking. or That's not why we're important. Oh, I understand that on the horizontal level, you know, we're important to people because of, of those things. But ultimate importance and ultimate value comes from God. Um, in Ephesus, there was a God in every yard. And Paul recognized that. He, he saw that. And life was just one of constant worship. And so here, look, look, look at the things in Western culture. I'm talking about the United States. Look at the things that we just have to have. Look at the material things that we have to have. Look at the relationships that we run after, that we seat that we we're, we're passionate to have these things or these people or these objects or these positions in our lives look at the things that we bow down to and say oh my goodness it's because of this that i'm important it's because of my family that's why i'm important it's my kids that's why i'm important look at the house i live in look at the job i have look at the look at the things that you know look at all of the trinkets that i've been able to accomplish and, and to collect in my life. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, we would say to the, if he, oh, you bunch of primitive heathens. Really? 
That's where they found their significance. That's where they found their importance and their value. Now, it was all self-generated, by the way. Because Paul made this incredibly unpopular statement. They be no gods that are made with hands. They be no gods. Now, that not only includes this, this little costume jewelry that they put in their pocket that was dead. Oh, they carved eyes in this stupid thing, but it couldn't see anything. What kind of God can't see? Can't see your need, can't see your hurt. Had ears, but it could not hear. What kind of a God? You pray to this God, but it cannot hear. It had a mouth, but could not speak. Well, I mean, what, what were they doing? They were deceived. This was a satanic ploy to draw their attention away from the God of heaven and put it on any silly thing, and that's how gullible mankind is. That's what Satan knows about us. We will eat anything that looks like food. We will swallow anything that sounds like truth. Did you know that 3% of rat poison will kill a rat? 97% of rat poison will fatten a rat. And I'm telling you that there are things that are being pushed in our culture as truth that are nothing more than poison. Moral, theological poison. Jesus is not God. He's a good guy, but he's not God. You know, he was just a, he was a good teacher, but he's not God. And I submit to you that if he's not God, he's a liar. If he's not God, then we have no business worshiping him at all. So why would you say that? Because he claimed to be God. He claimed it. In so many times in the New Testament, they, they approached him to kill him. Why did they kill him? Because they didn't like his shoes? Because they didn't like his hairstyle? No, they, they attempted to stone him on a number of occasions because he claimed to be the Messiah of the Old Testament that they did not accept and to this day do not accept. To this very day. Now, where do you get your identity? Where do you shop for your fulfillment in life? What is the thing or the person or the achievement or the accomplishment that makes you feel like, well, I'm somebody. People will sit up and take notice of me. What is it? Or what are the things that give us our sense of value? Whatever that is, welcome to the temple of your idol. Unless that person is the God of heaven. Now I realize that you know, what Paul was saying was very unpopular. It would wind up on June 18, 68 A.D., getting him beheaded on the Ostian way by the Roman government. One man. One man. Thrown in jail. One man. The Roman Empire was hundreds of thousands of square miles. Millions of citizens. And one man sent the Roman eagle screaming across the Mediterranean sky by sitting in his cell and writing letters. He wrote the books that we know as the prison epistles. And they fanned across the Roman Empire. And people heard the story of Christ. And they turned by the thousands away from this little pocket God. Threw it out. And turned to Jesus. And these people went nuts. So nuts that it would eventually cost him his life. So nuts that this very gospel that he preached was spread and everywhere Paul visited, he left a church that began to impact that community, impact those people, and then looked down through the centuries. 
During what we know is a period of the dark ages, 50 million of our brothers and sisters have been slaughtered because of their stance for Jesus Christ. And the world and its religions despise that because the world and its religions want the credit. We give you your value. We give you your importance. And no, they do not. And the world is not like to hear the truth does not like to hear the truth a man does not like to hear the truth he's not a woman you don't like that this is this is just this is amazing to me what's happening right now in the culture he said well preacher you, you can't don't don't offend anybody i don't care if the truth offends anybody i need to make sure and i've told you all this for years you can put medicine on with a cotton ball or a steel brush I would much rather the doctor put it on with a cotton ball. Let the medicine do the work, right? And if the message is rejected, I don't want it to be rejected because I was ignorant in the way I presented it or abrasive in the way I presented it. I'm, I'm simply telling you that truth is confrontational enough. When it is presented in love, that is the most powerful form of attack in the world against what the world says is true. And so here was Paul and, and at the, he was at the Harvard of his day. This was the faculty. Oh my goodness, these were the brilliant thinkers, the philosophers. And everybody, when they walked by, everybody was like, oh. you know, they just bowed with their intelligence. And then Paul comes along and it's just, this simple preacher. And he says, what you guys are saying, th these aren't gods at all. You have a, a monument over here to the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. And he preached the gospel. And in our culture, you say, well, that was, that was Paul. You're right. And he's been dead for 2,000 years. At least his body has. We live in the new Roman Empire. It is our responsibility now. Every Christian in here is a minister. Oh, you might not pastor a church. You may never be a missionary. You may work at the mines. You, you may work at CVS. You may work at Walmart. You may own your own business. You understand? But you are a minister. Here in politics, you are a minister to God to these people in the name of the Lord. So this is our time, folks, up to bat. Paul and his generation and, and many generations since him, they've, they've been up. They've, many of them have been killed for their faith. I don't know that that's going to happen to us. I'm not in any way implying that. But I am telling you this. We do not need freedom to be faithful. We don't need freedom to be faithful. Now, it's, it's great, isn't it? We're Americans. We've lived here. I've never lived anywhere else but Florida. I'm a native. I've never lived in another country. I've been in other countries when I'd go into the grocery stores and there was nothing on the shelves. I mean nothing. I've seen the water they drink, the food they eat. I've seen the houses they live in, and many of you have too. And then I come home. Oh, my word. We are spoiled rotten. When I turn the lights on, you know what I expect? Light. I've been in villages that the city will turn the power off at 8 o'clock at night. They have no power till the next morning. I like hot water. I, I just, we're spoiled rotten. And it's easy to fall into this trap of, well, the culture, the country, the government, they give us all of these wonderful things and, and I owe that. Well, no, I owe God my worship. That's who I owe my worship to. I need to pray for our politicians. I don't agree with very many of them. I could not disagree with anybody any more than I disagree with Joe Biden. 
I just, I cannot imagine anything that I would disagree more. But I pray for that man. And now, you know, my, my question in closing is, what's our idol? What do you find your significance in? What do you find your sense of relief? Your sense of worth? Your sense of identity? What gives you your sense of significance? If it's something or someone other than God, that's idolatry. That needs to be confessed. It needs to be repented of. And we need to bow our knees to the God of heaven and worship him. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your goodness. We worship you and you alone. My prayer is if there's a man or a woman or a young person in this room today that has never accepted Christ as their personal Savior, that this would be the time that they would say yes to the Son of God, that we would turn from our modern idols and turn to the living God. Would you do that? Thank you for your goodness. I pray that you would make us living translations the book that we love and study. I ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As we stand, our praise team sings. You need to come this morning. I invite you to come. We'll take a Bible and show you what you need to do to be saved. Really very, very simple. Whatever need you have, would you come this morning? your presence thank you for coming jim we appreciate it and tim wherever he disappeared to uh appreciate y'all coming pleasure to meet your family what a beautiful family you have and uh be back tonight now six o'clock wednesday night seven o'clock and then the 21st put that on your calendar we're going to meet down at beef old brady's at four o'clock uh, that afternoon we're going to have just a time of celebration for some very special people in in our church life and uh so thank y'all for being here. Y'all are a good-looking crowd. Do you know that? Y'all do know that, right? Every husband better be doing this right here. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. I love you. I appreciate you being here. And uh, let's be dismissed and uh, see you back tonight at 6. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for who you are. Bless us as we go home in Jesus' name. Amen. Clear to see, it's like the sunrise.